Well everybody, what's the crack? And welcome back to episode number 8 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, Inline G. We are going to get started this week with some very exciting news. For me personally, and hopefully you will share in this news. This podcast, officially last week after num- episode number 7, passed over 1,000 streams across all platforms. Fucking yes, man. Get in. It actually, today, has nearly hit 1,500 streams. I'm like four streams off that for this podcast across Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. So I'm fucking delighted with that, man. I'm famous now. I'm famous. This is it. I'm a TikToker now. I'm a, I'm a podcaster. I'm an influencer. The fame's already went totally to my head. I was drinking real Diet Coke this week. Like, not Freeway, Cola Light, 39p a bottle shite. I mean, Diet Coke. Man, who the fuck do I think I am? I'm living the good life. So, today's episode, let's get in and about it. Today's episode was actually going to be a part of last week's episode. But then it spiraled. One thing led to another. It's one of my favourite phrases. Is that one thing led to another? It's very poetic. One thing led to another and here we are. So, the initial plan for this episode was to be talking about Nazi symphony orchestras. I've lived in Germany for five years now. We've been doing this podcast for the last two months and I haven't even mentioned the Nazis. The Nazis. The Nazis? The Nazis? The Nachos? The Nazis. So, it's about time. I hear he's all saying, I knew he was going to do it. Well, here we are. We're getting on to the Nazis today. So, we'll be talking about Nazi symphony orchestras, as if that isn't a clickbaity title enough. We will... Actually, what I was going to do originally was to do an entire episode on terrorist musicians. Now that I say that out loud, I realise how fucking terrible of an idea that was. So the plan was, initially, I was going to find out, like, did any symphonic players in the Middle East also join ISIS in the last few years? Was there any clarinet players who did a bit of Al-Qaeda on the side? No, there's not many, and it's not that fun a topic. It's not as fun as I thought it was going to be. So I dropped that idea very quickly. I ended up just going back to, like, good old-fashioned Northern Irish terrorists, which I do love, and they all do play the flute. But the problem is most of them are still alive, and if I started talking about that kind of thing on this podcast, I could end up with a bullet in the post. So <laughs> I I dropped that idea like it was hot. But... We're going to talk today about the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra and their links to the Nazi party. Those two things started the podcast episode that spiralled into a whole thing about Johann Strauss, the second, the composer, who will from now on be known as the Scheid Strauss. And then, to balance that out, I'm going to talk about Richard Strauss, aka the Class Strauss, because class and Scheid are the two extremes of Belfast vocabulary. Think of them as like for anyone from Northern Ireland, think of them as the good Jerry Kelly, the nice Jerry Kelly, and the bad Jerry Kelly. Now, anyone not from Northern Ireland, go and Google Jerry Kelly. Find both Jerry Kellys from Northern Ireland, and you come and tell me which one's the nice one. Or the other one isn't nice. So yeah, we have the Scheid Strauss and the Class Strauss. We'll talk about both them. We're going to talk about their Nazi involvement, blah, blah, blah. And then we're going to end it by bringing it all back to the flute by talking about... Um, my favourite flute solos from both composers and the recordings that I like the most. How is about that for a stream of consciousness, huh? What about that for a fucking episode? What about that for a script? How do I do it? Last thing, before we get started here, uh, this week's drink. Ooh, the microphone did not like that. For the video listeners, you can see here this beautiful drink. This is Iron Brew. It's a Scottish drink. It's one of my favourites. Um, you can't get it in Germany normally, but I do have a guy, um, and he sorted me out with a bottle, or a tin, sorry. Oh, man, that is so good. Fuck. Mm. That just tastes like Scotland, man. Like, shite weather and religious intolerance. It's beautiful. It's a very popular drink in Northern Ireland as well. If any Americans are listening, or any non-Scottish or Irish people, go get yourself a wee iron brew. And I can't even describe the flavour, it just, it's magic. So on the drink, quickly, if you would like to support this podcast, you can click the link in the description, either on Spotify, Apple, wherever you're listening to it, or watching it on YouTube, there is a link in the description where you can go and buy me a drink. You're basically donating to the podcast. 
Now, this podcast is free. It will always be free. I have no plans to introduce a Patreon page or subscriber content where if you pay, you will get more than everybody else. Everyone will get a free podcast. It will always be the same. There will be no bonus content for people who pay. But if you feel like you want to support the podcast, help me out a little bit. Maybe pay some bills around this fucking place. Someone may as well. You can send me a couple of quid. Now, my recommendation is perhaps once a month, send me the price of a pint or a Dr. Pepper or an Iron Brew. So, I don't know, four euro, five euro, once every four episodes, if you feel generous, to support it. If you can't afford it, that's grand. Don't worry, you can enjoy it for free. Come on in, the water's lovely. If you can afford it and you want to show your appreciation, it would be incredibly appreciated. And to the people who have donated already, thank you very fucking much. I love yous. Now, let's get into this episode. Auf geht's, baby. Mwah. So, part one of this podcast is entitled The Nazi Philharmonic Orchestra. It's so clickbaity. I don't know what title I've put on this on YouTube, but it's going to be fucking terrible. But I need those clicks because clicks mean dollar. <laughs> so anyway, last week, female flute player episode, I started the episode by digging around for stories of sexism in the orchestral flute world. Now, there was one that stuck out in my head from years ago. Um, and that was Sylvia Carudu, the Italian flutist, and her trial period with the Vienna Philharmonic a couple of years ago. Potentially the world's most famous orchestra, I would say so, the Vienna Philharmonic. Anyway, the rumours around the time where, so she got a trial with as principal flute with the Vienna Phil, and then normally at the end of the trial, the orchestra will vote to accept it or not. She didn't get accepted by a very slim minority, or majority, and at the time, the, the whole discussion was around sexism. Now, I actually haven't found the stories. I, I read articles on this back in the day, and I read Facebook comments and had all that. They're all gone. So either I'm imagining it all, or the Nazis are after me. In which case, I'd like to see his fucking try. I know, fellas, in Belfast. The Nazis versus the UVF. Man, you got no chance. Anyway, Vienna Philharmonic. In the current Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, there are 145 members, and 15 of them are women. Just 15. So the Vienna Philharmonic was formed way back in 1842. Um, It's very Austrian and like most things in Austria, it is heavily weighed down by tradition. And it has this really strange audition process. Anyone who's not familiar with it, they don't hold external auditions. The only way you can audition for the Vienna Philharmonic is if you currently play in the Vienna State Opera, the Wiener Staatsoper. So you have to play in the opera orchestra for three years. And once you've passed your three-year probation period in the opera orchestra, you can apply to play in the Vienna Philharmonic. Now, again, that's a tradition thing that they've just kept. So they don't hold auditions. It's only people from that orchestra that will get in. Now, the orchestra only started letting women audition the state opera orchestra in 1997. That's a fucking disgrace. What movie? I, I I googled this earlier actually. Hang on, I find it. Yeah, what movies came out in 1997 to give you an idea of how recent that is? Jurassic Park: The Lost World. The second Jurassic Park was out in 1997. Hercules, the animated movie, was out in 1997. George of the Jungle, Starship Trooper, Air Force One, Batman and Robin, The Full Monty, Men in Black, Titanic. These are not old films. That was when the Vienna Opera Orchestra started allowing women to audition. Was the same year as George of the Jungle came out. Yeah, I know. I fucking know. They did have one female player up to this point, but it was a harp player, which was quite accepted. A woman called Anna Lelks. But until 1997, she was not considered a full member and therefore was not paid her full salary. I know. In 1997... So, while I read about this whole thing about the Vienna Philharmonic not allowing women to join, I found out that the Vienna Philharmonic have a very specific aesthetic in mind of how they want their orchestra to look. So, this is, of course, firstly, they want them all to be male. Penis is preferred. Now, if you go watch a video or look up a picture of the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, you'll notice something else they all share. They're all as white as I am, boy. They are white, snow white, boy. I'd... Might fit right in. Probably not after this podcast. I don't think I'm going to get a gig with them after this. Uh, Now, the fact that they all look white. This isn't an accident. I found an article when I went digging. Um, And the article was called The Image of Purity, the Racial Ideology of the Fianna Philharmonic in Historical Perspective by a fella called William Osborne. Now, he opens the article by saying, 
The Vienna Philharmonic feels, for example, that it is essential to exclude people whose physical appearance would not would identify them as non-Austrian, since this would damage the visual image of the orchestra and put in question certain characteristics of Austrian culture. Now, what that basically means is, if there is a foreigner in the orchestra, they have to look like they could be Austrian. Now, one person who auditioned, and they have kept themselves anonymous, they had this to say. I auditioned for the orchestra, and I laid in the point tabulations as long as I played behind the screen. So the first few rounds when he played, he was ahead in the points. Due to my name, it was not apparent that I am Asian. But when the screen was removed, I was rejected without comment. Friends in the orchestra confirmed my assumption they do not take foreigners, and if they do, then only those in which foreign appearance is not visible. And a former conductor even said, What I have noticed that is interesting is that the Vienna Philharmonic would also never take a Japanese or such. I hope that's a translation issue and they're not saying a Japanese. Um, if they took one, this would also somehow, by appearances, put in question the noble character of Viennese culture. But this is not racist. I mean, that's that's not racist because you know Austria would never, would never dream of judging an entire group of people to be racially superior to another group. They would never do something like that. Have such racial ideologies. I mean, fuck me. You see, when they make comments like this, do they not remember what they did? Like, you know, the the thing. Like your man, Hitler was Austrian. Austria loves to, uh, they love to pretend that Hitler wasn't Austrian, he wasn't one of theirs, and he didn't love Austria, and he's an Austrian boy, and they love to pretend that Austria isn't famously racist as fuck, which it is. You can't just change sides, lads. You can't have the racist orchestra and Hitler, and then just jump out. You've made your bed, you have to lie in it. They are a racist bunch of boys. So, this is where we get into this. 47% of the Vienna Philharmonic were members of the Nazi party before 1938 when it was still illegal to be a member of the Nazi party, the Nazi party. During the war, six members were found out to be Jewish and sent to a special camp. Seven further ones were found to be unsure, so we didn't know if they were Jewish or not, but they suspected something, so they were demoted to second chair. The Vienna Philharmonic also famously played for Hitler before he was in charge. They offered to play for him and Hitler loved them and he had them play at his wee famous rallies in Nuremberg. Mahler, Gustav Mahler himself, conducted the orchestra in 1898 and quit because he suffered three years of anti-Semitic harassment from the players, as we before the Nazis. Then the process of denazification started just after the war, so that's where all the countries heavily involved with the Nazis, so Austria, Germany, etc., etc. They went through public figures and people in positions of power and tried to get rid of as many Nazis as they could and tried to determine were the people in power actual Nazis or were they just going along with it because they would be afraid of getting shot. So that was kind of the denazification process. It took a long time. Now, when that started, first of all, the Vienna Philharmonic were given special status by the Austrian government. And of all the Nazis in the group, some of them were SS, Gestapo level Nazis. Only two of them got fired. One of them was because he he didn't audition. He got the job during the war automatically and didn't audition. So only one person was fired from the Vienna Philharmonic for being a Nazi out of the 47% of the orchestra. Toscanini himself, the famous conductor, refused to conduct them in 1947 because of this. Then fast forward to 1953 and they elected a former SS and Gestapo chief as their new executive manager. Now this was a generally fucking common thing in Austria after the war. The denazification process, they took their fucking time about it. They only formally acknowledged that they had a role to play and they only formally expressed their first bit of regret as a government in 1991. What films were out in 1991? Beauty and the Beast. The Silence of the Lambs. Austria only accepted they had something to do with the war in the same year that Terminator 2 Judgment Day came out. Fuck me. Man, what in the name of fuck is going on? <sighs> right, anyway. So, even more stories about this Nazi Philharmonic. There was a fellow called uh, Balder von Schirach, and he was the governor of Vienna in the war. He had some bad nicknames. He was a big Nazi boy. He was no G Nazi. And he oversaw the transport of Jewish people, tens of thousands from them, from Vienna city centre out to 
the special wee concentration camps. They're not camps to help you concentrate either. They're not training your concentration out there. I should stop making fun of this, but you know, this is what you expect from this podcast. I'm not making fun of the Holocaust or making light of it. I'm making light of the absurdism that the Vienna Philharmonic were so obviously involved with it and denied it. So when you hear this, Mr. Uh, Balder von Chirac, the orchestra give him their highest honour. It's a special little ring that they call the Ring of Honour and they give him that in 1943. Now... 1943, the war is still on, Nazi occupation. You could be forgiven for thinking, ah, they only give it to him because, you know, if they didn't, they would have, yeah, they would have got sorted out. They would have got shot. So better safe than sorry. Just give him the ring and say nothing. Shh, shh, shh. You'd be wrong if you thought that. You'd be talking out your hole if you thought that. Because after the war, he goes on Europe and trials and they say, right, 20 years in prison, you're a bad boy. Now he gets out in 1967. And what did the orchestra do? They sent him a lovely new replacement ring because he misplaced his fucking prick. Now, there was a guy called Helmut Vobisch, who was a trumpet player at the time in the orchestra, former Nazi party member and an SS chief, and he delivered the ring to him personally in 1967. What movies were out in 1967? Okay, I can't keep doing that. Um... But 1967, they were still delivering rings to former, like, tried Nazis who went to prison for 20 years. And they still had an SS member in their ranks, a former SS member, delivering rings to Nazis in 1967. Like, Jesus Christ, lads, read the room. So, also, with the Vienna Philharmonic, they keep archives, like most orchestras, of player salaries, what happens to players, what they're paid for, when they're not paid, when they've been demoted or promoted. Um, when they've quit the orchestra, when their contracts have been severed, anything like that. It's all kept on paper. It's kept underneath the Opera House in Vienna and for a very long time they wouldn't let anyone get access to the room that covers the period of the Second World War. Their defence was, we are a private company and not a public company and we are not obliged to give up this information. Now, yes, that is true, but like, I mean, lads, seriously, go fuck yourselves because you play for the public, you're a cultural institution, you take the public's money, you do get part public funding, you are responsible and reportable to the public. I'm sorry, but you don't fucking get away with that. So there was pressure and pressure and pressure on them for a long time. And in 2013, they finally let three historians in. Now, first of all, they only let the historians in for three months, which is fuck all in a research project. So these three historians went looking and they found all the information and research they could do before they went in to make sure when they're going in, they're hitting the ground running. And away they went in. Now, what did they find in the archives? Well, what do you think they found? They found, first of all, we confirmed how many members of the orchestra were Nazi parties. So in the wartime, it was 60 members of the 123. Again, before 1938, when it was still illegal, which was also higher than the average person in, or the average rate of Nazis per people in Austria. So they were very Nazi. They found out how many people were sent to concentration camps. It was very clear in the documents. And they found out about our friend from earlier, Mr. Helmut Vobisch, the trumpeter and the SS general, who was sacked in 1945 as part of the denazification process. But then they waited till the dust settled and they went, right, nobody's looking anymore. Get your man back. Get your man back. Fucking ring him up. You got his number. Ring him. Here, get him in. Don't tell anybody. Just fucking get him in. They bring him back two years later. Head trumpet. And then a few years later, what else do they do? They make him the orchestral manager. Because why the fuck not? Sure, he was only an SS chief and a member of the Gestapo, but sure. Why would that bother you? Now, the orchestra, they commissioned this whole report because they were pressured into it. If you Google Nazi, or Nazi Philharmonic, you'll get my podcast if you Google Nazi Philharmonic. Do that. No, if you Google Vienna Philharmonic Nazis, one of the, the first results that will come up is their own website acknowledging a little bit of what they got up to during the war. Relatively speaking, like they acknowledge what happened between 1938 and 1945 wasn't great, but they don't really go on and beyond that. Because of this process, they actually did finally take the ring off your man in 2013, which is a fucking disgrace as well. So the historians only got in for three months. I reckon there's more in there. They'll never find out. And I'm telling you lads, old habits die hard. That orchestra is still racist as fuck today, as I've talked about. And to give you an example, from a flute player, no less, the co-principal flute, Dieter Fleury, who, if you Google his name or YouTube his name, you'll find out he did a lovely masterclass in Carnegie Hall a few years ago for some young Americans. Because why the fuck wouldn't you invite him after he said this 
for West German State Radio. In his interview, he says, From the beginning, we have spoken of the special Viennese qualities of the way music is made here. The way we make music here is not only a technical ability, but also something that has a lot to do with the soul. The soul does not let itself be separated from the cultural roots that we have here in Central Europe. And it also does not allow itself to be separated from gender. Mm. So if one thinks that the world should function by quota regulations, then it is naturally irritating that we are a group of white-skinned male musicians that perform exclusively the music of white-skinned male composers. It is a racist and sexist irritation. I believe one must put it that way. If one establishes superficial egalitarianism, one will lose something very significant. Therefore, I am convinced that it is worthwhile to accept this racist and sexist irritation because something produced by a superficial understanding of human rights would not have the same standards. Now, to translate that from bollocks, because that's <laughs> that's translated from German to English and it was originally in bollocks and then he put it into German and then someone's translated into English. It's a little shite. It's spoken like a true politician because he's trying to hide what he really wants to say. You can read between the lines. It's not that fucking hidden, like, let's be honest. But what he's basically saying is... There's something very special and inherent to the Viennese soul that is intertwined with being white, Central European in his words, looking Central European, being white, and being male, which he says very clearly, tied to gender. And I don't think he has an idea of gender fluidity or non-binary. I think he means lads. Which is some bollocks artistic excuse, artistic in quotation marks, to justify not letting ethnic minorities or women in. There is no such thing as the same soul. If you're a white Central European and you're a male, you have this soul. That is bollocks. There are plenty of scumbags in Austria as well who don't have the soul to play in the Viennese or the Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra. And there are plenty of lads from or ladies or in between from different parts of the world who do have that soul. The fact that it is unique to Central Europe and males is dog shit. So anyway, we'll go back to Sylvia Carradu to wind this up. I don't know what happened with her. I don't know if she was, if she didn't get approved because of sexism. I have my suspicions, but I can't prove it, so whatever. But I will say, the Vienna Philharmonic's big concert is the New Year's Eve, or the New Year's Day concert, sorry. 1st of January, every year, 50 million people watch it in 80 different countries. Now, the complaints, the official reason, or the official complaints made about Miss Carradu were that she doesn't play in time. I suggest you go on the YouTube and watch the 2019 Vienna Philharmonic New Year's Day concert and see Miss Carradu play, and you tell me she's out of fucking time. If Sylvia Carradu plays out of time, none of us have got any fucking hope. It is dog shit. She is a magnificent flute player. Fucking incredible. There's no, uh, there's very few flute players that you deserve better. And she didn't get the job because she's a woman and she's Italian. She's not Central European, she's a little bit further south and she was obviously on that line for them and they didn't let her in. And that's my opinion, I'm sticking to it. Fuck yous. Anyway, right, we're going to move on to the next part of this podcast. That's too long. Right, so part two of this podcast is going to be about the Scheit Strauss, Johan II. Oh man, I'm brute. Oh, it's got loads of bubbles in it. Fuck. You can get WKD flavour with that as well. Jesus Christ. Oh, it's so good. Right. Here we go. The two Strausses. The Scheidt Strauss first. Johann Strauss II was born in 1825 and he clocked out brown bread in 1899, both in Vienna. Lived and died there. He got to the ripe old age of 73, which in my opinion is too long. He was Johann Strauss II because his dad was the first. He was also Johann Strauss and he was also a very mediocre composer. Strauss's grandmother was Jewish. Hold on to that wee fact for later. I wonder where that's going. Um, so Daddy Strauss wanted his son to be a banker. Didn't want him to do the family tradition of being a shite musician. But his father discovered that his son was secretly practicing the violin one day. And now, I, I don't know what article I got this from, but it says, He gave him a severe whipping, saying that he was going to beat the music out of the boy. And as soon as I read Beat the Music Out of the Boy, I just, my head, my head instantly went to like a Southern, a Southern American going, Beat the music out of the boy. Beat that music out of the boy. I beat your ass. I'm, if I get cancelled for that, it was fucking worth it. Uh, I've got my notes. Beat the music out of the boy in quotation marks. Accent? As if, should I do that? And it's too late now. Anyway, um. He did get to do music eventually because in 1834, his dad went out for a pack of cigarettes and never came back. (laughs) 
basically his dad found a mistress and fucked off from the family and never came back so he's he can whip the boy all he wants but yeah anyway typical morals of a fucking shite house expect nothing less so anyway like father like son the two of them both they both wrote waltzes we waltzes the dad wrote the Radetzky march shite um, the son wrote the Blue Danube, duh, 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 and he also wrote Deflated Mouse, which is actually alright to be fair, but yeah, the Blue Danube shite. Think of him like the original Andre Ryu. Shite. So he doesn't write real music. That's why I don't like him. He doesn't write real music. It's shite. It's all just silly wee tunes that old people clap along to before the cold hands from the grave come up to pull them underneath. <laughs> Man, it's, it's popular with old people. It's shite. It's very popular in Vienna in that shite period in Viennese music history. There's two Viennese schools of music. The first Viennese school is like Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, I think Schubert's in there as well officially. And the second Viennese school, which is also fucking amazing, is like Weber and Berg. Weber and Berg, who's the third one? Schoenberg, yeah. That was rocking. And in the middle, they had a wee quiet period and that's where Mr. Sauce comes in, mediocrity. Think of him like the the 2007 Real Madrid team, they still won shit, but, you know, their star players were like Fernando Gago and Higuain and fucking Gabriel Heinze. They weren't as good as what came before and they weren't game- good as what came after. Great tradition and a general level is what sort of kept them floating up and that's the same with Strauss. He's from Vienna and he ruled the Vienna scene for a little while in its down period. So that's him in relation to, yeah, the Viennese music. But the Nazi Philharmonic Orchestra, aka the Vienna Philharmonic, still fucking love him. Now, the New Year's Day concert features almost me, nearly entirely music from the Strauss family. So basically the entire program is Strauss family music. They do throw in the odd proper composer as well. I think in 2009 or 2010 they did uh, the end movement of a Haydn symphony because he was dead for 200 years. But generally speaking, it's just Strauss. The odd little bit of something else. Um, and they do the same program three days in a row. 30th of December, 31st of December, 1st of January. And the one on 1st of January is broadcast on TV. 11.15 every year from the Music Verein in Vienna. Now, to be fair, the Music Verein is fucking gorgeous building. I went there last year. My best friend Jad took me to see it. It is very special. Shout out to Jad. Um, but this is where the Strauss link to the Nazis starts. Because... You would think the Vienna Philharmonic but not going about for a couple of hundred years. Surely they've had this New Year's Day concert since then. It's a great tradition. You'd be wrong. Do you want to guess what year it started? Go on, I'll give you one guess. Based on the topic of today's episode. Ding, ding, ding. 1939. So it actually started originally as a concert for the Winterhelswerk, which is a charity started by you-know-who, the National Socialist Party, a.k.a. Nazis. Uh, so normally before that, the Vienna Philharmonic played actual fucking you know, real music, like good music, not the fucking shite, not the Blue Danube. Like, um, but the Nazis saw it as a cool way to like unite the nation, especially the Blue Danube. Oh, it's so shite. I think actually, am I right in saying yeah, the Blue Danube has the same three opening chords, three notes as the start of the second movement of the G major Mozart flute concerto, just slower. If someone told me once that they think Strauss stole that off Mozart and his flute concerto, in which case he's bastardized it. But anyway, the Nazis loved the Blue Danube and they loved Fledermaus. Um, now, as I said earlier, Johann Strauss had a Jewish grandmother. Can you imagine how well that would have went down in the Nazi party? So Joseph Goebbels, the head of propaganda, took it upon him himself to make a public campaign to hide the fact that Mr. Strauss had Jewish heritage. And apparently even Hitler, Adolf himself, when he was talking about Strauss and Franz Lehár, another composer who had Jewish ancestry, Hitler said, I decide who is Jewish. I decide who is Jewish. <laughs> I'm going to get cancelled for these fucking accents. That's like halfway between Hitler and Borat. I'm not doing it on purpose, I swear to God I'm not. Um, after the Nazis, anyway, the Vienna Phil, they just kept rocking on with this concert. They just kept doing it year after year. So why wouldn't you just keep a good old Nazi tradition going? What, what could possibly go wrong? Why would you even bother changing it? But if it just keep it going, why the fuck not? Stick the Blue Danube back in. Who cares? And even these days, the guests of honour at the New Year's Day concerts, you'll always see them when you're watching the videos. They sit up in the high seats. It's like the Austrian military in like full fucking military gear. Look out for them. So... Like a ticket there, I think, costs like 1,100 euro minimum, and you have to apply years in advance and all that shit. It's a shite concert anyway. Shite music, shite concert. And that's why this Strauss is the shite Strauss. Shite music, Nazis love him, 
Let's go for the better Strauss. Okay, part three, the class Strauss, Richard. Not Richard, but I, I, to be fair, I speak a bit of German, and even Richard is hard to do, so we will go with Richard for the rest of us. For the sake of argument, and also if you want to Google him, it's Richard Strauss. He's has Strauss. So anyway, the good one, he was born in Munich in 1864, and he died at the ripe old age of 85, which was good shooting back in the 1800s. It was good shooting. He died in 1949, sorry. So, that's the class Strauss. What was class about him? Firstly, his music is fucking insane. The good. Um, so he's from the very late Romantic era, you know, Wagner kind of time. To be honest, he nearly classed him as early modern. Like, we're going, he's pushing past really heavy, heavy themes, ideas, rich orchestration, and the harmonies are fucking delicious, man. They're crunchy and gorgeous. And he wrote loads of different types of music. He didn't just write shite wee waltzes like someone else. So the most well-known of his style of writing would probably be the tone poems, which is like a 10-15 minute one movement thing for orchestra. It's a new form at that time. It's, think of it as like a 10 minute symphony, essentially. It's a one idea thing. Quite loose in form. So his tone poems are Don Juan, Death and Transfiguration, Symphonica Domestica, the Alpine Symphony. The most famous one is... Also sprach Zarathustra, or Thus Spoke Zarathustra. You'll know it as the one that's at the very start of 2001 A Space Odyssey, or if you've seen the new Barbie movie, it's also at the start of the new Barbie movie. Do, 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 do. I can't sing in tune. Fuck. Um, yeah. Google it. There's not a person on this God's green earth that doesn't know that. That and Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. Everyone just knows it. He also wrote some operas. And two of my personal favourites were in there. Uh, Salome and Electra. He wrote a couple of horn concertos. A violin concerto. Opal concerto. And he wrote the four last songs. Well, obviously songs. And they're incredibly well known. So when the Nazis took power. Strauss. The good one. The class Strauss. Was already a big deal in Germany. And when the Nazis took over, he took two big jobs on. He took the head of the state music chamber, which is basically, it was a new post invented by the Nazis. Basically, you're in charge of music and deeming what is okay and what's not okay and what's getting programmed. So if you're the big boss of music. And he also took on the job as director of the Bayreuth Festival because Toscanini quit because he said the Nazis can go fuck themselves. I don't think he said those exact words, but that was the intent. Um, so on paper, you would have looked at this and went, well, Richard Strauss looks like a bit of a Nazi. He's taking all these jobs here. But it isn't so. So it came to light later on that his daughter-in-law was Jewish and her entire family was Jewish. So one of the reasons he took on these posts was to help protect her and her kids and her family and blah, blah, blah. And he also took up the job where he headed the music in Germany because he wanted to prevent censorship and use his power to do that. And he did a lot to protect copyright laws for musicians to make sure they get paid properly and also make sure that real music was getting played, i.e. I, I, not the other Strauss. Um, for example, he also, Fanny Mendelssohn's music got banned. Grow up, by the way. Yes, her name's Fanny. Fucking grow up. You're better than that. Um, he made sure that ban on Fanny Mendelssohn's music was lifted and her music was reinstated. Same with the music of Gustav Mahler, who was Jewish. And he also insisted on keeping Stefan Zweig as his own personal librettist for all his operas. So when he was writing the words for his operas, Stefan Zweig did it. Now, if you haven't read Stefan Zweig, by the way, fucking do it. It's unbelievable. I think he's most well known for, like, the Marie Antoinette biography thing. And he has a book, a short story about chess called The Royal Game, I want to say. But he's got a novel I like, called Beware of Pity. Unbelievable novel. Zweig is feverish. It's... It's one of those books you wouldn't put down. Like, I genuinely mean that. Stefan Zweig is fucking class. Um, but he was Jewish, and Strauss insisted that he stays as librettist, and that was a step too far for our Nazi friends. So they said, right, you're on your fucking arse. Right, you get big son, we're moving you on. So he got chucked out just before the end of the war. But he did manage to keep his daughter in all safe. He got her put on house arrest, which means the Nazis couldn't get there. Unfortunately, a couple of dozen of her family did get rounded up and sent off to the wee camps. Um, in 1948, Richard Strauss was officially cleared of any wrongdoing during the Nazi, Nazi regime by a denazification panel in Munich, one year before he died. So, in the end, he was proven to not work with the Nazis and was actually found to be actively working against them. So, he's a good guy. So, why is he the class Strauss? Great music, 
and he pissed off the Nazis. Okay, part four of this podcast. <laughs> I had a plan here, and I lied to you guys about 20 minutes ago. I lied through my fucking teeth. You should never trust an Irishman. I told you I was going to give you my favourite flute recordings from both composers, but do you know what? Honestly, after doing this podcast for the last 20 minutes, I don't want to give you one from Johann Strauss. Okay? It's shite. If you want to go and clap along to the Boo Danube, do it, alright? Or a Radetzky march from his dad or whatever. Go clap along to it, but honestly, the quality of the orchestra makes zero fucking difference. It's easy music, it's shite, and it's easy to do. If you want to just clap along and listen to the Boo Danube, you're beyond saving. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, go do that, but don't fucking come crying to me now. But as for my man, Richard Strauss, my favourite piece of his is the opera Salome. So originally it's a it's a one act opera and it's based on the German translation of Oscar Wilde's play. Oscar Wilde obviously being well not obviously for you guys, but he was an Irish writer. Irish, why did I say that that way? Irish writer. I have had such a thing about my accent on this podcast because I've noticed on TikTok, even though I said that, I'm doing this to excuse me, Iron Brew's kicking in. Um I need to stop doing that. I have to find that line between my normal accent and one that can be understood on this podcast but my tiktok's full of fucking people speaking with that wanky northern irish accent you know the one that like the posh northern irish one how dare you oh no yes of course tiktok that kind of wank um and i find myself kind of doing it a little bit recently on this podcast in an attempt to be understood so i'd rather be not understood but sound cool doing it so if you don't understand me tell me and i'll send you the fucking subtitles or something also i have a thing with my tongue i think i talked about this in episode one um i can't say tease properly i had to go to a speech therapist in paris this is true as bill true as god i went to a speech therapist and i was studying in paris i was like fucking 25 like um and she was like well you're 25 why are you only coming now and i was like oh yeah because you know play the flute and I've, i think it might be a part of it i can't say tease properly and the reason is because i have a really fat tongue and she was getting me to say all these words in french and trying to work out what was wrong with it and then she was like oh where are you? you know you're not french are you and i went no 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 where are you from ireland she went oh that explains it then <laughs> so apparently Irish people's tongues are basically disabled so yeah I've had to get that fixed and that affects my that's why I try to speak better because the first time I recorded this podcast I said welcome to the N9G flute podcast and every fucking subtitle machine kept saying foot podcast and if anyone knows me I fucking hate feet I wouldn't thank you for a foot so it made me book and I had to re-record the whole thing so yeah anyway that was a huge deviation what was I saying Salome, Oscar Wilde wrote Salome, right? Um, he was Irish. He was very Irish. He actually wrote Salome in French, so Oscar Wilde didn't write it in English, and he didn't do the English translation. The English translation was done by a fellow called Robbie Ross, one of his friends, just before Wilde got sent off to Reading Jail for being gay and all that. Um, Oscar Wilde is one of my favorite writers. Salome is probably my favorite thing by Wilde because it's so different to everything Wilde does. We sort of associate Oscar Wilde with well, he has one novel, a Picture of Dorian Gray. Um, but he also has like plays like The Importance of Being Earnest and Lady Windermere's Fan. All like kind of funny, light-hearted plays on uh, upper-class culture, the bourgeois culture of Victorian England. Salome is not that at all. Salome is a dark, dirty, deeply sexual, deeply disturbed opera. It's scary nearly and it's really psychologically fucked and it's brilliant. And I feel like Strauss really captured that in this opera. It's virgin on uncomfortable to listen to, but it's a powerful thing, especially when you listen to it live. It's like, whoa, mate. Honestly, I would recommend it. And if you're ever trying to get into opera, it's super short. It's a one-act opera. I think it's like 35, 40 minutes through the whole thing. Maybe a wee bit longer. Definitely less than an hour anyway. And you can sort of break, jump in and out of it as you like. Um, also, if you want to watch a version of it, my favourite version of the play is Al Pacino. There's a movie of him doing a stage version of it with um, the Ginger Girl. Not Bryce Dallas Howard, the other one. Jessica Chastain playing Salome. And uh, Al Pacino also plays the king in it. It's a weird idea, but it is class. But anyway, the opera's amazing. I highly recommend going to it. But there is a really famous flute solo in it. Just at the part called The Dance of the Seven Veils. Which if you're looking up it on Spotify and stuff, you'll find it on its own. It's the track from it just orchestra there's no singers at this point um and in the story it's a part where salome is dancing for the king to sort of sweeten him up and stuff it's a bit sick because they're kind of related and all that kind of stuff but anyway um so the solo starts it's a really dirty flute solo now there's a lot of great recordings of this solo obviously and normally i would be 
trying to find you the recording that you should go listen to that is underrated that you wouldn't find when you search it but I'm gonna I'm gonna go against my own rule this week just for this because Jimmy Galway has recorded the solo when he played with the Berlin Philharmonic and it is Jimmy Galway at his fucking peak it's incredible I know it's very cool for students these days to hate Jimmy Galway and blah 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 but listen, you listen to this and you tell me it's not some of the best fruit playing you've ever heard. It's him at his peak. Before he went off and did the pop stuff and sort of experimented a lot, when he was at his best, he was incredible. And no one does the solo better for me and gets that attitude and that's that uh, that character of richness and darkness and dirtiness and uh, just gives you a bit, of, you know, a bit of that, like a bit of fucking uh, a big dirty pint of Guinness, you know, but a nice creamy dirty pint of Guinness. It's got that kind of feel to it. Um... Anyway, it's as good as it gets. And he does do the thing with the scales. So when he goes up a scale, he like pulls the first two notes. So instead of going digga 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 he goes digga 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 digga. I know it seems kitsch, but it's kitsch. Again, I'm gonna fucking put this on a t-shirt. It's kitsch because Galway did it for so long and so many people copied it that it then became a parody of itself. When he did it, it was revolutionary and it was reflective of the style. So open up your ears a little bit too when you're listening. But anyway. I'm going to put in the first few bars of it right now to sort of wind this podcast up. I'll see you in about 15, 20 seconds because I can't put too much in again, otherwise I get nicked for copyright. And this podcast is getting very close to being cancelled for a number of reasons. So the last thing I need is a copyright claim on my back as well. So here it goes, a little bit of Jimmy Galway playing the solo from Richard Soyce's Salome to give you a wee flavour of it. Enjoy it, boys and girls and everybody in between. that boys i have to pretend to react like i've just heard it but i'm gonna put it in and post editing but here oh, what about that what about that i hope i can find it if i can't find it i'm gonna put in i'm putting man i feel like a woman by shania twain and shock the shit out of you all anyway listen guys thanks for coming along to the podcast if you've made it this far you've listened to the whole thing thank you i'll give you a few yeah say my usual shit at the end here but just because I say it every week doesn't mean I don't mean it. Genuinely appreciate you guys listening. I still get messages from people telling me they discovered the podcast. I cannot believe that there's people now in... I looked up the figures the other day of where it's being listened to. There's people in Australia, Canada, America, um, Ireland obviously, and uh, France, Germany, Austria, Poland. Austria's going to stop listening after this episode. <laughs> Unless it's the head of the Gestapo over there. He's back. Guess who's back? <laughs> World War Two, Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> Hitler's revenge. Right, sorry. Anyway, thank you all for listening. It's genuinely appreciated. It really is. Um, your feedback's really appreciated. Uh, also, sorry, I have to put this in, but uh, apologies to my grandmother. My grandmother's probably watching. I had her on the phone today. Or my nana, as I call her. I'm not going to say grandmother because I'm not a fucking Victorian child. Sorry, nana, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop swearing. My grandmother, ring, I ring my grandmother about once a week. I'm my grandfather to talk about life and get a catch up of who's dead in Belfast. <laughs> and um, she always mentions the podcast. And my grandfather watches it. He enjoys the podcast, but he only pretends he enjoys it because, you know, pretends he doesn't enjoy it because of the swearing. You know, but my grandmother... She doesn't like to swear. Now she hates that I swear on this. Every time I phone her on the phone, she's like, "I, I saw your podcast. I fucking saw it. I don't know." Um, so I, I ring, her, I ring her every week, and she takes it off of me. Even though I have her, I've heard her say the f word. She's, <laughs> she's gonna murder me for saying this in this podcast. But I heard her say the f word in Christmas Eve in two thousand nine, when her brother turned up unexpected to her Christmas party with a new partner that nobody knew. <laughs> and I was sitting in the kitchen, and she came in. It was just me and her, and my mum, and she didn't realize we were there. And she just came in and went, "Oh." <laughs> that was one of the best moments of my life. So she always says I should use my great vocabulary and not resort to swear words. And then after that, she said she's going to cut my throat if I ever swore in her house. So that's the pot calling the kettle back. Anyway, Nana, I'm sorry. I'll do my best next time. I think this time wasn't too bad anyway. 
Um, anyone else? Everyone else? I know you love the swear, and I know you love it. You minxes, you love it. You love it. I'm recording a very special episode of this podcast this week as well for you guys, and it is a special episode, episode ten. So this is only episode eight. We got another episode to go, but I'm recording episode ten this week. So the day before, the day this comes out, I will have a massive hangover from recording episode 10 the night before. That's a wee trick, as we hint of what's coming up. And I've got a guest coming on, your first guest on the Inline G Flute podcast. It's going to be fucking mental. So yeah, if you're listening to this on the Friday that this comes out, whatever the Friday, the 25th or whatever it is, send me a message and ask me how the hangover's going, because I will be hanging out my ass, hanging like a bat. It'll be a great episode though. I really look forward to making it. Thank you guys, as usual. If you want to do me any favours for this podcast and you can't afford donating, share it somewhere. Please, like, share a video, tell a friend about it, stick a video up on your Instagram story and tell me you did so I can go in and tell you how wonderful you are. Getting it out there is really helping. Um, yeah, do all that stuff if you can. If you don't want to, I don't care either. I'm just very happy. I'm very happy that you're here. I appreciate you all. I love you all. Big smooches. Have a lovely weekend. Get yourselves a wee iron brew. That's so good, you really should get some.